We, we are gathered here today to encourage one another, to be a blessing to one another. That's why we come to church. Man, people are missing out when they're sitting at home, still in their pajamas on Sunday morning, watching TV, drinking coffee. Maybe some of them are still asleep. They're sleeping through the best part of the week. Amen? Amen. We come together. We meet together to encourage one another, to learn God's Word, to, to uh, lift up one another. That's why we're here this morning. And and we're, it's so important to do that. We, we've entered into a brand new year. We're a, a week into it today, aren't we? January 7th. I dated my checks wrong, but that's okay. Uh, at least I got 24 on there, maybe, and not 23. You know, that's hard to do once you start changing. But, uh, but here we are in this brand new year. This is a great time to look back at the new year. Now, I know the scripture says, He that looketh back is not worthy. But sometimes we got to look back to see what we've learned in this past year. See what God has brought us through. I'm not telling you to linger there because we're moving forward. The, the time just keeps rolling, right? So we just keep moving forward and following the Lord. But it's a great time to look back. It's a perfect time to look ahead as well. Are we living that kind of life that God wants us to live? Are there any changes that he wants to make in our lives in this new year, 2024. That's just crazy to even say that, isn't it? I'm sure if we answered that question honestly, if we ask God, Lord, is there anything that I could do better? I'm sure if we ask him that, he, can, he will speak to our hearts. Now, listen to him. Let him speak to your heart. Is there anything we can do better? And so we're beginning a new sermon series this morning called Better. Better. We want to do better. And so during this series, we're going to look at four different areas. This morning, we're going to talk about priorities. And then we'll talk about relationships. And then we'll talk about choices. And then we'll talk about our witness. So those four things we're going to talk about and how can we do better in those areas. Let's pray together. Father, we just thank you this morning. We thank you for this new year. Lord, I pray that you would help us to live better lives in, in ways that honor you and bring glory to your name. God, I pray that you would help us prioritize our time, our talent, our energy in such a way that it will be fulfilling and faithful. Lord, we need your help. We need your help more than we did last year. Lord, to serve you and to become the the, the believer and the follower of Christ that you want us to be. And so we look to you this morning. We ask that you would help us to become better, Lord. Father, we thank you and praise you. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. So priorities. Let's talk about priorities this morning. As we do, I, I want to illustrate something with these uh, rocks in this box this morning. So this, this box represents your life, your capacity in life. And so we have limitations, don't we, in this human body? We have limitations with our time. We have limitations with our finances. We have limitations in our life. So, so we've got to be careful, don't we? So the, we, here on this, uh, this stand here, you see some small pebbles, and you also see, also see some large stones. These, these make up an illustration of our priorities. Like these rocks, some of them are large, right? Some of them are large. These are, these are the large priorities. What do you think some of the large priorities in life are today? What are some of the biggest priorities? What are the most important things that we need to be focused on today? Any ideas this morning? Hello? Focus on Jesus. Wanda, what would you say? Living for, Christ. Living for Christ. Amen. Those are big priorities, aren't they? And, and a believer's life. If you're not a believer, that's not a very big priority. But, but if we're going to be following Christ, that's a big priority. Any other ideas about large rocks, things that are very important that we need to be make, make sure we're focused on? Family, our jobs. Yeah, those are important things, right? Prayer. Prayer, absolutely. Prayer is something that's important. Attending church, coming to church. I talked about that, how important it is we come together to encourage one another, to be a blessing to one another. 
following the Lord. Any other ideas about the big rocks in our lives? School, yeah, education, that's important. We have to dedicate to that, amen? Okay, so the big rocks are important. The more important priorities. And then the little rocks. These are things that, activities maybe that we do. Things we like to do, the entertainment that we watch, the, the things that we do. What are some examples of that? Playing cards? Yeah, that's fun, isn't it? With the senior citizens. No, no gambling going on? Well, that's no fun. Uh, but uh, anyway. <laughs> okay. It, absolutely. Any other ideas about the little things in life? Watching football, yeah. How about them Cowboys? All right. So, what a NASCAR, yeah, that's an entertainment that Jeff's likes, okay. Gardening, yeah, that's cool. Chickens, yeah, raising chickens, raising ducks. So, there's little things in life, right? Playing video games, you know, young, younger people play video games. I don't think Andrew has ever been a gamer, but some of his age are, you know, they play video games, listen to music. Go to movies. Lonnie's a gamer? Oh, golfer, yeah, okay. <laughs> Golfing, yeah, that's, a, that's something we do. And, and so that, those are represented by these little rocks, right? And, and, and not necessarily sinful things, but things that we enjoy. God tells us to enjoy life, right? So we, the problem is sometimes we, we put all the little things first. And then we try to get the big things in our, in our lives, in our capacity. It, you know, I told you this box represents, well, that's about as full as I can get it. And we still got some big priorities left over. Here's church. Here's that prayer. We don't have it in the box. Here's the studying the word of God. Well, we didn't have time because we got all the little rocks in there first and uh-oh, we're in trouble, right? So priorities, we've got to realize that if we get the big rocks in first, you know what? I think the little rocks will come together. So let's try this again. But let's start. Jeff, you're going to have a tough time vacuuming, I can tell you that. All right, so now let's do this. So we've got some of the big priorities in there, and... Along with those priorities come a little bit of uh, the small priorities, right? But then we make sure we get these other priorities in. And along with that comes just the right space to get everything else in. So God's not a killjoy. He wants us to golf, Brother Lonnie. I do believe that. And he, he wants Pastor to golf more. I believe that. More in, more in 2024. Get better in golf, right? That's one of, well, you know. Anyway, we can get it all in. But we got to get the big rocks in first. Now, there was a few of those rocks that fell out, you remember? And at times, sometimes God says, you know, that's really an unnecessary thing. Maybe it's not a sinful thing, but maybe it's something that just takes too much of our time. And we don't have room for the big rocks. Folks, that's what I want us to talk about in, in this sermon. Our priorities about serving God, about putting the, the, the big things first, making sure we're putting those things first. Everything else is going to come together. You know, I was reading in, in, uh, in Genesis this week about Noah. And Noah, you remember what God told him to do? He told him to build an ark, and he told him he was going to send a flood, and he also told him that he was going to send all the animals to him, and, and he would be able to bring them into the ark two by two and, and, and do that. And, and, but you know what? Noah, he was a great example of setting the right priorities. He, he, he started building the ark, and he didn't worry about the animals. The Scripture says in, in Genesis 6.20, that God brought the animals to him. Noah didn't worry about, oh no, I'm going to have to go out and I'm going to have to gather all the, the, uh, the dogs, all the cats, all the, all the uh, species. And, and No, God just told him to build the ark. God gave him the big rock and said, your job is to build the ark. 
And he did that. He started working to do that. You know what? God brought the animals to him, two by two, just like they were supposed to. So he is a great example. We don't have to worry about the details on which we have no control over. We just have to serve God, and and he'll do the rest. The Bible speaks about this need to order our lives well. God knows without keeping the main thing, the main thing, reading the scriptures, studying, prayer, attending church, fellowshipping with other believers, those big important things. If we don't keep those things, the main thing, we're going to get lost in the little things. We're going to get lost in little things. Some of these rocks were shiny. I think they have some gold in them. That's the little ones. And they can be distracting, right? So, I got three points this morning. How do we keep the main things the main things? Number one, seek God first. Seek God first. The most famous sermon in the Gospels is the Sermon on the Mount. In Matthew chapter 6, we see a portion of that. Jesus turns to preaching and teaching about how we have the tendency to worry about our lives. In Matthew chapter 6, it's the worry chapter. Maybe some of you can relate to this right now, and, and maybe you have some legitimate reasons for concern right now. I'm not telling you that there aren't things that we don't need to be concerned about. Maybe paying the bills, maybe... Uh, physical ailments, maybe we're worried about our children, maybe we're worried about our marriage, maybe we're, we're worrying about what this new year might hold. Jesus states that trusting the Father is the only way to keep us from being paralyzed by anxiety. We've got to trust God first. Seek Him first. In verse 33, Jesus gives us an answer to our worry. In Matthew chapter 6, verse 33, But seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. Folks, we've got to seek God first. Did you hear the language, uh, the priority in that language, in that statement? Seek God first. He tells us that when we seek after a life that pleases God, all the things that we tend to worry about will fall into proper place. When we put Him first, everything else is going to come together and be okay. So let's talk about that, how that's going to look, at, look, at, look like in our daily lives. So we'll talk about our marriages. Those of you who are married, or maybe you're not married, if you seek God first, I guarantee He'll bring the right relationship to your life. I was counseling somebody just this weekend, and and, uh, I said, well, if you get into church, you'll find the right spouse. Get in a body of believers. You want to marry somebody that is of like mind. If you're a man of faith, you're a woman of faith, you've got to seek people of faith. You can't go to the bar and find a relationship. You go to the family of God. If you're a part of the family of God, if you're not, well, go ahead. Knock yourself out. It's going to be a tough time. I think about, you know, our marriages. We, we, if we put Jesus first, we're going to mature into a more gracious, a more loving, and a more kind spouse. If we'll put God first, we'll, we'll become Uh, like him in more ways it it will be a blessing to our spouse I was thinking about the illustration of the woman who had a terrible husband he was mean he was rude he treated her badly and she was telling somebody about it she said and this person counseled us I got an idea you begin to treat your husband like a king you Take his shoes off when he gets home from work. You wash his clothes. You do everything you can. You treat him like you've never treated him before. You treat him like a, a, the king that, that, uh, of the whole world. You just do what you can to be a blessing to him. And then all of a sudden just walk out on him and drop him like a rock. That'll teach him. The, the lady said, that is a great idea. I love that. So she began to do that. She began to treat him 
man, she did everything. She cooked perfect meals for him. She had his breakfast ready in the morning. She had his dinner ready at night. She washed his clothes, made sure they were laid out and ready to go when he got up in the morning. She did all she could. She did that for months. And finally, the friend came to her that counseled her and, and said, okay, when are you going to drop him? She said, drop him? Man, this guy has become a great husband. He loves me. He's doing things for me now. He's serving me. I'm not going to drop him. Folks, if we'll put God first. Now I understand that everybody has a self-will. That man could have chosen to be as mean as ever, continued to. But in our illustration, he didn't. God can make the way, right? I think about our finances. We talk about marriage, now let's go to the finances. Perhaps focus, focusing on God first may reveal to us how much we spend too much on things that don't matter. Those little gold pieces in here. Right? How much do we spend on things that don't matter? If we focus on God first, He's going to reveal, wait a minute. You can't pay your tithes this week because you bought too many of these. Uh-oh. Now it's getting quiet. You know, one of the important areas of our finances is obviously our income, right? How we go out and how we earn a living. That's important. And God will provide us with the income we need. But another very important part of our finances is our tithe. Giving to the Lord and His work. I like what John Corson says in the article. You'll like the title. It says, Blessed be the tithe that unbinds. He wrote in his article, he said, God doesn't need our money. Therefore, tithing is not his way of raising cash. It's his way of raising kids. Think about it. Tithing is not a way of raising cash for God. He doesn't need money. He owns the cattle on a thousand hills. But our tithing is a way he's raising us. He's, uh, tithing is not God's way of getting money, Corson says, but his way of developing maturity. That's his way of developing maturity in our lives. D.L. Moody said, I can tell you more about the spirituality of a man by looking at his checkbook than I can by looking at his prayer book. Again, it's getting quiet. There we go. I recently saw a video just this past week of a little kid. And they put down in front of this kid, they put $10,000 in cash on this side. And they put two Oreo cookies on this side. I don't know how old the kid was. He was probably Logan's age or maybe a little younger. And the guy said, okay, you got this $10,000 in cash and you've got two Oreo cookies. Which do you choose? The kid didn't hesitate. Not one second did he hesitate. He said, I want those cookies. I want those. The little things. Now, I know God is not all about money. But folks, we, we often choose that. All My granddad used to call it an all-day sucker. Somebody gets a wad of cash or gets whatever they choose and they go out and waste their money on an all-day sucker. I think Brother Hurd, do you remember Brother Hurd? He said that too. Brother Hurd was a wise money manager. So how can we relate this, relate this to Christian maturity? This kid chose the cookies because of his lack of maturity. He could have bought thousands of cookies. But he didn't realize what he, was, what he was choosing. And so often we choose those little things and we don't realize what we're leaving off the table. We want to mature. And, and as we tithe, that shows that we are mature believers, that we're trusting in God. We're putting Him first. Focusing on God first, bringing the first fruits to Him, that first 10% of your income will reveal how much we spend too much on the things that don't matter. You know, God doesn't love you any more or less if you tithe or don't. He loves you just the same. But He wants you to mature. He wants you to move forward. He wants you to, to keep the, the right priorities in your life. 
So marriage and finances are important. If you have children, maybe some of you still have children in your home. Maybe you're helping raise your grandkids. When it comes to our children, we may find that putting God first makes us more patient, makes us more understanding with our kids, as well as more consistent with our discipline based on God's Word. And we have better wisdom in raising and training them up in the way that they should go. That's when we put God first. And then we move on to other relationships in our lives, whether it be, you know, we talked about marriage, but there's other relationships. When we put God first, it'll help us love others unconditionally. It'll help us walk in forgiveness when we put Him first. It'll help us walk sacrificially, not only for those we love, but even our enemies that we're called to love. When we put God first. So think about these priorities. Is God at the center of your marriage? Or is God at the center of your uh, look for a spouse, your, your, uh, uh, your relationships, or, or your, maybe you're unmarried and you want to find a spouse? Put God first and He'll direct you to the right place. Is He at the center of your finances? Is He at the center of your family? And all of your other relationships... When you put them there, folks, things again, people have their own self-will. They may twist off and still do something crazy. You can't control that. They have their own self-will. But as long as you put what needs to be first first, get the big rock in place, you'll be okay. Don't seek after those smaller stones too much. Is your energy and attention divided so much that you can't get all the important things in your life that you need because it's too consumed with the little stuff? I had a hard time biting my tongue during our Sunday school lesson this morning because we talked a lot about priorities, didn't we? I said, nope, I'm going to wait and preach it later. <laughs> Tom Landry, you know who, most of you know who he is, legendary head coach of the Dallas Cowboys. Uh, Christian man, believer in the Lord. I think that's pretty uh, strange now in the NFL. Uh, not to say that, I, I know there's a lot of believers. But anyway, Tom, they asked him, how did he become so successful? And he said, in 1958, I did what every person who wants to be successful needs to do. He put the right priorities for his life. He said, God, family, then football. This is with Tom Landry. You know, the world today would tell him, no, put football first, Tom. If you want to be successful in football, you got to put football first. What are you talking about? Putting your family or putting God before that. But that's what he did. And folks, he had a successful career. we got to put God first. How do, we, how do we do that? How do we seek God? we got to do it like anything else. It takes time. It takes energy to do so. It takes intentionality. We've got to be intentional about seeking God. And remember, it's a marathon. It's not a sprint. People sprint to church on Christmas. People sprint to church on Easter. People sprint to church maybe on Thanksgiving. But they forget about everything else in between. We've got to seek God day in and day out. I seek God as I do this. When I do it, I'm looking to do things that shape my life into something that looks like Christ. Obedience, loving, being courageous, and sacrificial. That was what Christ was like. And when we seek God and we read His Word, we're going to see those, those characteristics in the Bible and we're going to want to become like that. And not only are we going to want to, but He's going to empower us with the presence of His Spirit to make us become like that. If we're getting close to Him, we're going to become like Him. <laughs> I've used this illustration before, but when my grandparents lived over here and they were pastoring here, they had a book of missionaries. And, well, it, was, uh, it wasn't, some of them were missionaries, but they were uh, credentialed AG ministers and their wives. And their pictures. And I just started opening that book and I was just laughing my head off. Because the, the people looked like each other. There were 
elder ministers that have been in the ministry for a long time and they look like one another. They look like brother and sister. I know that wouldn't have been right, but that's what they look like. Why? Because they had spent so much time together. <laughs> they look like one another. Some of them were the same shape. <laughs> We want to be shaped like Christ. We want to know Him. And when we get close to Him, we're going to look like Him. Now the Pharisees and the Sadducees, they tried to trap Jesus, asking about His priorities. In Matthew chapter 22, verse 34, it says, But when the Pharisees heard that He had silenced the Sadducees, they gathered together. One of them, a lawyer, asked Him a question testing him and saying, Teacher, which is the great commandment in the law? Jesus said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang the law and the prophets. Did you catch the question that he asked Jesus? He says, what is the greatest commandment? He could have as easily had said, what is the biggest priority in your life? And Jesus tells him, love, your, love God with all your heart, your soul, and your mind. That was his way of telling him, you love God with your whole life. You make sure that you're prioritizing your life around God's plan, not your plan. God's plan, not your plan. Which brings us to our second point. you got to love God with all you have. Seek God first. And then when you find Him, love God with all you have. How can you tell when you love something or someone? The easiest way to tell is that you talk about it or them all the time because they're always on your heart and on your mind. When, when a couple falls in love, that almost makes you sick because they're always talking about one another. Oh, he did this or she did that. You know, that's just part of it. They're always talking about them. Maybe it's a sports team that you love. You bring them up all the time. How about those cowboys? David shaking his head. <laughs> or how about those Sooners, right? Or maybe, maybe not only do you talk about them, but you'll put something on that has OU or the big Dallas Cowboys star. I ordered a cap this week with a star on it. I just can't wait to get it in. I know, Lord, that's one of those little rocks. Don't, don't take it from me, Lord. <laughs> But, but we'll wear those uniforms. We'll wear a jersey with our favorite player's name on the back of it and advertise that we like these guys. Folks, do we do that for the Lord? Have we put on Christ? Are we wearing that compassion? Are we wearing that sacrifice? Are we wearing those characteristics of Christ in our lives? Are we showing the world? Are we talking about Him to people? Are we afraid to talk about God when we get into those circles? Uh, you know what I'm talking about. We, he needs to be a regular topic of our conversations. We need to look for reasons to bring him up. We need to love him with all we are. Loving God with all your heart, your soul, and your mind helps you to realize that every part of your life is incredibly meaningful. And how we live our lives shows how we love God. This means how we handle our career. How we handle our study. Maybe you're still in school like Andrew and Cooper. Do all you do as unto the Lord, the Bible says. Love Him with all you have. As we parent our children, I remember when we were raising our kids, oh my goodness, I didn't know what to do. Valerie and I, when we married, man, we had, we had kids. <laughs> and I'm like, oh Lord, how can I raise kids? How do I do it? A lot of prayer, a lot of reading James Dobson stuff, listening to James Dobson on the radio, I remember that.
folks, let's love Him with all we have. Let's look back 365 days from now. If the Lord tarries, 2025, January 7th, let's be able to look back and say, look how God made me better in loving Him. I've grown so much in this, this one year's time because I've got the big rocks where they need to go. And the little ones, I've, I've gotten rid of those that I don't need to, to, to use anymore. They're, they're taking up too much of my time, too much of my resources. Folks, God meets our needs most fully when we prioritize His purpose and His plan in our lives. Jesus ends this conversation with the man. He tells him to love God with all your heart, soul, and your mind. And then he says, love others like yourself. If we get loving God right first, we will love others. If we don't get loving God right first, we have no hope in loving those around us, especially our enemies. And he told us we got to love our enemies. So prioritize all that God lays on your life. Prioritize the things of God. The big rocks. Love God. Love others. Those are two big ones. Love God and love others. So love God with all you have. And also the final point, we, come, we become better by focusing on the eternal rather than the temporary. We, we get better by focusing on the eternal rather than the temporary. One easy way to know where we put our energies this year is by asking the simple question about anything we face. Is this eternal or is this temporary? To spend our time focusing on serving others is to focus on their eternal souls. When we serve others, when we sacrificially serve one another, we are, we are focusing on their eternal soul. We're affecting them eternally. On the contrary, if we spend all of our time focusing on building our own kingdom versus His kingdom, we're going to run out of space. Which one is better, the temporal or the eternal? It is the eternal, isn't it? Which one's more important? It's the eternal. Apostle, uh, the Apostle Paul understood this distinction as he wrote to the early church in Corinth in 2 Corinthians chapter 4. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 16 through 18. He said this, he said, Therefore we do not lose heart, even though our outward man is perishing. Yet the inward man is being renewed day by day. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, is working for us far more exceeding an eternal weight of glory. And then in verse 18, this is key. He says, while we do not look at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporary, but the things which are not seen are eternal. Paul says we should not spend our time focused on what is seen. All of our time. Some of the time we have to focus. I mean, we live in this world. We've got to focus some things on temporal things. But if we focus all of our time on those, that's like filling the box with the small rocks first. The big rocks don't fit in afterwards. The things which we can see will one day pass away. That Camaro that I want so badly, but Valerie keeps saying no. She says that because it's a temporary thing. So glad I have a good wife. She helps me, keeps me in check. So we got to focus on things which are seen. Which is easier? To focus on the things that you can see or focus on the eternal? That's a trick question. Folks, the answer for me is it's easier to focus on the things we can see. Those dishes that need to be washed. That 
that the grass that needs to be mowed. Okay, we were talking about this in Sunday school. There's those priorities, right? Those things that, that need to be done. Yeah, they need to be done, but wait a minute. You haven't read your word today. You haven't called that person that you needed to encourage today. You haven't done this thing that, that really about the eternal thing versus the temporary. The grass is going to grow one more day. It doesn't matter. The dishes might be a little harder to scrub if they sit there for a few more hours. But what's important is the eternal. And so because it's easier to focus on the temporary, because it's things we see, we live in human bodies, we have to be very intentional about the, the eternal things that we need to be focused on. We've got to be intentional about it. Making sure we're spending time in the Word of God every day. Making sure we spend time prayer in prayer every day. We have to be intentional about it. Folks, the enemy is constantly sowing the seeds of that bearded darnell that Jeff taught us about this morning in our wheat field that, that will distract and pull us away from what we really need to be focused on. So we got to be very intentional. Let's focus on the eternal. I know there, we, we need a house over our head. We, we need a, a vehicle to drive. We need food to eat. And, and those things are real needs that we have, but those are temporary needs. And, and God's going to take care of it. If we'll put the rocks first like Noah did, he built the boat and the animals just came. They just showed up. That's great, isn't it? They just showed up. You pay your tithes, you put God first in your finances, He's going to mend those holes in your pockets. You don't, that money's just going to flow right out. And the 90%, the 100% that you kept is going to be like you got 10% left. Over the doorways, there's, in, there's a cathedral in Milan. And there are, there are three doorways. And over each one, the first one, there's a beautiful wreath of roses. And, and it says underneath, it says, All that which pleases is but for a moment. Over the second one, there's a cross sculpted. And there are words that says, All that which troubles us is but for a moment. But underneath the, the great and central entrance to the main aisle is this inscription. That only is important which is eternal. If we we'll realize these three truths, the things that trouble us, they're just passing things. The things that are beautiful in this world, they're passing away. Enjoy them while you can but realize they're passing away. All that's important is that which is eternal. So as we go through this series over the next few weeks, we, today we talked a lot about priorities, and there's a lot of others we could have brought into it, but let's ask the Lord, God help me to prioritize and get everything in there that needs to go in there. Show me what is necessary for me to follow you and serve you. If there's little things that are taking up too much of my time, my treasure, my resources, God, show me that. How can I reorder my life? What could be reprioritized? And really, maybe you've never surrendered to Christ. Maybe you've never repented of sin and received this gift of salvation. There's no way you can prior, correctly prioritize your life until you know Christ. So make that your first thing to do this new year. If you don't know Christ, ask Him into your heart. The Bible says if you believe in your heart that Christ died for your sin and was raised again and you confess it with your mouth, you will be saved. And then the Lord's going to come in. He's going to come in and love you with all He's got. You'll be able to love Him with all you got. You'll be able to prioritize your life. I'm not telling you everything's going to go smoothly. You won't run into a few bumps down the road, but because you will. But I'm telling you, it's going to shake out okay. In the end, it's going to be all right. 
So if you don't know the Lord, I want you to ask Him into your life today, right now. Pray that prayer. They call it the sinner's prayer. Lord, I'm a sinner. Save me. I, I repent of my sin. I ask you to come into my life. I believe you died for me and rose again. Pray that prayer and, and He'll come into your life right now and save you. And then as a believer, make sure the things that receive your time, your energy, your your t- uh, treasure, your affection are the things that will last. And as we close this morning, I want you to pray, Lord, show me the big rocks in my life. Show me those that are maybe sitting outside because I couldn't get them in. But there's little stones in my life that are, that are taking up Too much treasure, too much time, too much energy, Lord. Help me to know that. See it. Father God, I just praise you this morning. I thank you for the word. I thank you for our Savior, Jesus Christ. Lord, as we bow before you this morning and we recognize priorities maybe that have been misplaced, I I pray that you would help us, Lord, get them in the right spot. Putting the first things first, Lord. God, we ask right now that you would help us and direct us. Help us to love you with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. Help us to love others. Help us to focus on the eternal. Help us to do all these things we've talked about today. God, help us 